Springs. Um, our call to worship this morning is from Psalm chapter Psalm 15, verse 1 and 2, page 657 in the Pew Bible. O Lord, who may abide in thy tent, who may dwell on thy holy hill, he who walks with integrity and works with righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. May the Lord grant his blessing upon the reading of his word. Let's stand and sing our first hymn this morning, A Child of the King, number 439. Scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50 through 58, page 1371 in the Pew Bible. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we all shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. 
May the Lord grant his blessing upon the reading of very powerful scripture. <clears throat> so good morning, everyone. Um, pardon me if I look like a, a tomato up here. It's, it's a little hot, so um, my face will get redder the hotter I get. Um, so this morning I have a couple of announcements. The first is that this week on Thursday we will resume Bible study. 7 p.m. here in the church sanctuary. Um, then next Sunday, we're going to start our Sunday morning off with a dedication of a tree to Pastor Dave. So we hope you can all be here. That will be before service starts at 1045. And then after service, we're going to have a, a luncheon. There is a sign-up sheet in the back um, if you could bring something to share with your fellow congregation members. Um, that would be wonderful. Um, next, not next Sunday, the Sunday after, October 1st, Pastor Matt Gardner will be back um, to share the Lord's word with us, so please make an effort to be here um, on the 1st as well. Um, there is a bulletin um, that you received this morning. Uh, Joanne and Bob talked to us about Operation Christmas Child last week. Um, they aren't here this week because they're down in Wildwood for the Firemen's Convention, and we hope they have a great time. Um, but please uh, make sure you pick up some boxes, and let's get started this year on fulfilling um, some children's wishes uh, with the gifts that we give them, but most importantly, the word of the Lord that comes with each box. Um, I want to also acknowledge that since... Bob and Joanne are in Wildwood. We have a special guest in the video operating room. So, uh, Mr. Erickson, we are thankful for you <laughs> taking the reins. And he and I have a deal that he will not turn the microphone on while I'm singing. So, <laughs> we're good. Um, and then we have some flowers today in honor of um, Mr. and Mrs. Erickson's 50th wedding anniversary, which was the 15th, right? And this time, the flowers are presented to um, the glory of God from their family. So congratulations again, Mr. and Mrs. Erickson. And then I have um, two names to please add to your prayer request, uh, prayers this week. Um, the first is for Alice Longmire. She's been experiencing pain in her left leg, which is her, her good leg. Um, we took her to the, to the ER yesterday to get checked out. They said it's just arthritis, which is causing a pinched nerve, which is causing that pain. So if you could please pray for her for some relief. And since she'll be watching this later, hi, Mama. Um, the second name to please add to your list is Janet Straub. She's also been experiencing some pain in her legs, and um, she was taken to the hospital last night and was admitted and she has lymphedema. So please pray for Janet that she also gets some treatment and some relief from that pain and pray for Bob who is taking care of her and, um, and being there for her and supporting her. Those are all of the announcements I have this morning. If I could call our ushers forward so we can give unto him our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings.
doxology together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these blessings that you've shared with the church, and we thank these congregation members who um, give of their hearts and tithe unto you in accordance to your will, and we ask that these blessings be used um, in a way that pleases you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, now we've come to our time of prayer, both personal and united, so I'll give everybody some um, time to speak to the Lord and tell, you, tell him what's on your heart, and then we'll join together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing together your church family here in your sanctuary, as well as those who watch us on YouTube. Where one or more gather, we know that the Holy Spirit joins us, and I think we can feel that today and every Sunday that we celebrate you together. And we are just so grateful for the blessings that you've given this church and all the members um, here, all, all the people through past and present who've attended LSBC, I feel like we've, um, we've been blessed by so many great things. And though we've experienced challenges, um, we know that those challenges provide opportunities for us to grow in our faith in you. And Lord, we ask that you surround um, the members of this church with your your grace and your your healing presence. There are those um, who who need you to provide some some sort of relief for them. Um, we'd ask that you be with Alice and Janet as they experience some difficulty right now, and we ask that you put some healing upon them. And Lord, we ask that you continue to um, look after this church family as we spread your word. And we are thankful every day for being present in your church. And we thank you for the men that you've brought to us to preach for us, to share the word. Thank you for Frank for being here today. Thank you for um, the goodness that can come out of just opening our hearts and our minds to, to this word that will be shared. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand and sing our next hymn, number 592, which is Tell It to Jesus.
special music this morning is coming from the lovely Lori. She's going to play us an instrumental version of Shelter in the Storm. Thank you, Lori. And now we're going to be blessed by the word with Frank Buck. Thank you, Lori. That was great. Morning, everybody. Well, today we're going to be in Philippians chapter 3. And of course, as you know, I teach in my Sunday school class, and this just happens to be where we landed. It's the end of the chapter. And it's kind of the culmination of the thoughts that Paul's had throughout the chapter, especially the last part of it. So I want to do kind of a quick review to set context for what Paul's been saying to the verses we're going to look at today. I'll just read those verses to you that we're going to look at today. Philippians 3, 20 and 21. It says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into the conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. They're great verses. Um, what's Paul been thinking or what's he been saying or how's he been encouraging the Christians up to this point um, where he culminates this chapter? And um, I want to kind of look back to verse 12. In verse 12, Paul says to the believers, he says, not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Paul's not a perfect Christian. Any perfect Christians in here today? None of us, right? We're all working. We're still working for Christ. And, and I, as, as you, this is a great verse because it says, you know, Christ has laid hold of, that word lay hold of or apprehend it. In, it's, a, it's a struggle. It's like when a policeman apprehends a criminal, right? There's a hard work in apprehending. A, how hard did Christ have to work to apprehend you? Right, how to work on you, right? So he's apprehended you, and now what's Paul doing? He is striving to apprehend all that Christ has for him. So this is part of how we as Christians should be thinking. Are we striving to know what the Lord has for us in our lives? Um, are we seeking, if you will, his will for our lives? What does he want me to do today? I was kidding our class today, you know, we're all, I think we're all getting older, but um, as we get older, we sometimes uh, get frustrated with things we used to be able to do, and now we can't do as much, or we think we, well, God knows our limitations, doesn't he? And look what he says in verses 13 through 15, brethren, 
I do not regard myself as laying hold of it yet, but one thing I do, and this is the important thing, what's he doing? Forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, or as many as are mature, I think that word is best translated, have this attitude. And if anything, you have a different attitude, God will reveal that to you also. What attitude should we have then? What are we supposed to do? Are we always supposed to be looking back and where I should have done this, I should have done that, oh, why haven't I done that? What's going to happen if you're trying to press on to the goal and get to the end successfully if you keep looking back? You're not going to do so well, are you? You're not going to win the race. So stop focusing behind you and press forward to the upward call of Christ. Do what God has set forward for you to do and be content. I know we were talking just a little bit this morning and you're so, you know, we, we get into places and we're thinking, Lord, is this really what you want me to do with my life? Continue on, continue to, if you will, lay hold of what Christ has for you, not only a year from now or six months from now, but today. What would Christ have you do today? And then keep your eyes fixed forward. And trust Christ as you go through each day of your life. And if we look at verse 16, Paul wants us to live consistently. He wants us to have a life that's consistent. He says in there in verse 16, however, let us keep living by the same standard to which we've attained. To the same standard. How much have you learned in Christ? Keep doing it. Don't let people take you off course. Are there things out there in our world today that can kind of come in and we hear these things and we get off course? We start to believe. Are you believing with all this nonsense that they're telling you out there today? Huh? Or are you, or you staying, are you staying and living according to the same standard which you've learned? Has anything changed in God's word? Not a thing. Praise God for that, right? Praise God for that. They're always telling us out there everything that has to change. No, keep living by the same standard. What can happen to Christians? We can start to believe false messages that are out there. I've spent some weeks teaching on this, and there's other things we can believe. He wants both us individually and as a church to continue to live by that same standard. And I think one of the bad things that happens is when we don't continue to follow biblical teaching, if we don't continue in the Word, if we don't continue in the Word being infallible, then we have a problem, right? If people start to say, well, God's word is God's word, there's parts I believe and there's parts I don't believe, then we could start making up anything, can't we? What good is it? God's word is truth from the beginning to the end, and we stand by it. What happens when, when it's not? Churches and people's lives are not continuing by the same standard to which they've attained. And it's a real problem with churches today. It's a real problem with people. You know, I, and I'm, I'm going to be politically incorrect here, and I'm going to say that what's happening is churches are starting to believe in the immoral messages that are coming from the world, okay? They're say, and don't get me wrong, I want you first, to, 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 as I say this, what's the problem? Well, the church has veered off of what God has set for it to do, okay? It doesn't embrace immorality as good. Are we supposed to take the message of Christ to save people who are leading immoral lives? Of course. Of course. We love people. We want all people to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ as their Savior. But we don't say that we're going to compromise on what the Bible teaches and say, well, it's fine if you live an immoral lifestyle and you're a Christian. That's not right. Don't let them make you believe that. They're forcing that down our throats. We hate no one. They'll, they would say what I'm saying right now is hate speech. There's no hate at all in it. We're standing by what God has said, the same standard. We're living by the same standard to which we have attained. Be careful. Be clear. We love all people. We want everyone to be saved. And boy, is there a need in our country today, isn't there? Such a need. And so Paul, that's what Paul's instructing us to do. Don't go off course. And as he does that, he says, follow godly examples. Can you pick some godly examples of people's lives you can follow? He says, 
In verse 17, brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Paul wants us then, if, if I'm to summarize what he's saying here, he wants us to serve the Lord with all our might. Keep our eyes focused on the end. Don't change. Your doctrine hasn't changed. It's still the same. Keep living by that doctrine and look to godly examples as you live your life. But he says, be careful. Because when, although there are godly examples, he says in verses 18 and 19, for many walk of whom I often told you and now tell you, even weeping. Paul's crying. Think of that. He's crying as he writes these words that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things, whose glory is in their shame. Can you imagine? What can you, Do you look at the world today as... I mean, my goodness, we just went through Pride Month, whose glory is their shame. Now, Paul's crying because of the impact these, these things are having on the church. Okay, and I believe, you know, I, I read a bunch about this, and we can't know for certain, but I believe these people were inside the church. The enemy, what's it call them there? Enemies of the cross of Christ. They're in the church sowing doctrines that are not consistent with biblical teaching and the church, unfortunately, and I, I kind of said this before in our Sunday school classes, they want to be relevant. They want to be relevant to the world. And so they're willing to change the things that they do. And by the way, I'm not saying we have to sing hymns the way we did it in that order. That isn't my point. But we're willing to compromise on the word of God to be attractive to the world. That's a big mistake. Do we want people to come in? Of course we do. Do we want to preach the message of Christ? Of course we do but we don't adopt their lifestyles and we don't adopt the things that they're doing when it's clearly at odds with what's in the scripture. Beware of them. Paul's crying because of all the harm that happened to the church as a result of their willingness to compromise with these teachers who, by the way, were coming into the church. And as they came into the church, so when you see leaders promoting things that are ungodly, whether it's works-based salvation or whether it's immor immorality, which is so prevalent today, and that's why I keep using that example, because I think it's infiltrated our churches in many places. How can a church be a church that's a church of Jesus Christ when they're following that? You can't. Now we, and, and there are many other examples. There, and of course, Paul spends a lot of the New Testament on people who thought that they could please God and have salvation by doing works. It's another huge problem that the churches believe, that if I can please God, he'll save me. Salvation is not of ourselves. It's through faith in Jesus and his finished work and what he has done. It's all of him. But Paul's weeping because they had come in. So be careful who you're following. Be careful of uh, what's going on. And so I think as we, as we see that, then that leads us into the verses that we get today. And there's kind of a contrast there. Notice that, that he describes people who are not true teachers of the word. He describes them, first of all, their end is what? Destruction. Not a good end coming for these people. We want them to be saved, by the way. God says their end is destruction, but he gives them time to repent, to turn to Christ. He said, whose God is their appetite. In your King James, it's their belly, right? He, it's, it's about their sensuality. It's about their, their own uh, physical bodies. It's about themselves. That's where their appetite is, and their glory is in their shame. They stand up and they march around showing you all the things they stand for, and in fact, it's shame. Pretty relevant, isn't it? I remember when I was teaching this, I guess it was last week or the week before, I'm like, this is very relevant to what we're seeing today. Their glory is their shame, and their mind is on earthly things. They're not focused on God. Please. Paul's crying because people like us are getting led astray by this. Don't let it lead you astray. Keep focused and keep walking in the way God has taught us. Why? Your citizenship is in heaven. Look at verse 20. 
from which we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our Savior. That's where our citizenship is. We live in a fallen world, don't we? Who are, what are we? We are citizens of heaven, this, this verse is teaching us. You know, citizenship would have been interesting in the time of Philippi because the Philippians would have kind of aligned with this thought. What, what was Philippi? What were, who were they really citizens of? Rome. So Rome was the capital city. They were all considered part of the Roman Empire, but they weren't in Rome, were they? They were away from Rome, but they were citizens of Rome. Remember, Paul was a citizen of Rome, right? So they were citizens of a place that they weren't living in. They were kind of an outpost, if you will. And so I think that there's some real analogy Paul was using here, because I think Paul kind of understood that, because he was a Roman citizen. You're a citizen of heaven. The same idea. Heaven is where we are citizens. We're not there yet, are we? We're at the outpost, aren't we? Outpost earth. That's where we're at. We're, we're here, and we're serving the Lord, and yet we're citizens of a place called heaven. And we're eagerly waiting Jesus, for Jesus to come from that place and take us there. And that's kind of what he's, what he's saying here at the end. But, you know, what's even interesting, there's also an issue of power here. When Christ comes, there's a power. The Roman power would have been a big power, and they knew that, that power. But there's the power of Christ. Power, the power of Christ. That's why I named this, this thing the power of Christ. It's the power of Christ that was coming. What was he going to do? He's going to transform them and subdue all the rest. We're going to spend some time on what is this transformation. He has to transform our bodies so that we'll be fit for where we're about to go. Our citizenship is in heaven, and that's what Christ will transform our bodies to make us fit to be there. And I, I will pick that apart. You bear with me. Hopefully we got enough time here. Um, I think we do. Uh, look at them. They're all worried. Uh, anyway... <laughs> But, but I think, first of all, as you think about these things, right, as we think about Christ and we think about how he saved us, how he's with us to enable us to lead our lives today, how we grow in the Lord, all of these things, and our future is all wrapped up in Christ. Our lives are wrapped up in Christ. As Christians, our lives are wholly wrapped up in his and we depend, everyone here saved, right? You've all placed your faith in Jesus Christ. Then he's your savior. He's already done that for you. Is each one of you, are you finding that every day you have to depend on him to give you the power to do the things he wants you to do? Let alone just get out of bed. Give me the strength just to get out of bed, Lord. And then give me the strength to obey you. And then give me the strength to do the things you want me to do. Direct me, guide me. All of these things are us depending on Christ. But there's still more, isn't there? There's more coming. The completion of our salvation is coming where we're delivered from our present body and we're raised in new bodies. And the completion will come when Christ returns a second time. And it tells us here, we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. So everything about our lives then is wrapped up in him. I hope you can see that. I was trying to explain it to my Sunday school class. I don't know if I did a good job in putting this together, but, but I hope you can see that. Our past, our present, and our future, and this is Spurgeon said this, our past, present, and future are only as bright as he shines on them. Every need, every hope, every enjoyment, everything we possess comes from his hand. And we really have nothing without him. You know, as we consider that, and as I watch the world around me, it's getting pretty dark, isn't it? Every day, I can't believe that it seems to get worse. And I'm sorry if you don't feel that way. I feel that way to some extent. And I don't mean to depress you that way because I think one of the key things is our hope is not in this world, right? That's the citizenship issue. We're here. And I, and I don't want to mislead you 
uh, to say it doesn't matter, but our citizenship is not here. But each day it gets worse, and sometimes that can, that can weigh on us. But Christ is with us. Christ, Jesus does not fail. Okay? He's with the believer, and his promises are just as true today as they were yesterday, five years ago, ten years ago, two thousand years ago, when they were written down. Have hope in Christ. He is coming back. And I can say that to you, you know, we can argue the, the details of the sequence. That's a waste of time, in my opinion. He's coming back. The question is in how that's going to play out. The question is, are you ready? Are you watching? All those parables at the end of Matthew, what are they about? Are you ready? Are you ready for Christ to return? Are you looking to him? Are you trusting him? Remember his words, too, as you, do, as you live your lives, as we live our lives, can we even live our lives effectively without Christ? You can't, can you? It's only as we depend on him, and again, the power of Christ. His power is the power that enables us to walk in a way that's pleasing to him each day. And I think um, the power of Christ, then is, is again, it's in our lives. Our hope and our joys are dependent on his power. Our salvation from sin, as I've said, is dependent on his power. Our daily lives are dependent on his power. Our future is dependent on his power. Everything is dependent then on the power of Christ. And how much more does that mean we should look to him each day, right? Let's not fail to do that. I think sometimes we ought to ask ourselves, how do I define success? We're all getting a little older. I could see, I see a couple younger, but we're all getting a little older. How do you define success? Ever think about that? Defining success, do you define it as the world? You know, I watch these politicians. I can't believe it. Nancy Pelosi, 83. I think I'm going to stay in Congress. Why? <laughs> Why? Why would you want to do that? Whether you like her or you don't like her, I'm just looking at her and I go, why would you want to do that? And, and, and you know, they look for worldly power, for money and for fame. Our success, though, is wrapped up in the power of Christ and daily depending on it, daily walking with him. We can't do anything without Christ. If you remember, just a story to kind of illustrate that. Remember when Jesus was at the, um, after his resurrection, they were at the Sea of Tiberias, and the, and the guys, the apostles, they're out, they're out fishing all night. Right? What did they catch? Nothing. They came up, at, you hate that when you go fishing and you come up empty. At least when I play golf, I hit a good shot now and again. But you can go fishing and come up with nothing. Well, they come up with nothing, right? Jesus wasn't with them. Then, then they look on the shore, and there's, there he is. And he says, Put your net, throw your nets over there on the right side of the boat. They got so many fish, they can't even pull them all in. When Christ is with us, we're successful. When Christ is there, we can work as hard as we want, and we're going to come up with no fish. We have to depend on Jesus. So it's his power in our lives now that we're dependent on. The power of Jesus. And we have that. Isn't it great to know when you wake up in the morning you have the power of Christ? I was a little slow this morning. I was tired, to tell you the truth. <laughs> and, uh, and here he is, the power. I pray, give me the power, Lord, to take this message. But not only that, that it would have an impact on you. That's what's important here. This message, is it, does it encourage us? Do we see this power of Christ that we need each day? As Paul wrote this, we know he was in jail. And as he wrote it, he was, uh, you know, as I mentioned, he was concerned about the churches. He was concerned that there were enemies out there. But he wanted to assure them that they could count on Christ. And... Um, one of the key underlying motivations for pursuing Christ-likeness, and I'm not saying this is the only one, but, but this is one of them, is the fact that he's coming back. It's an encouragement throughout the New Testament. Um, we certainly are encouraged by what Christ has done for us. We're encouraged by what Christ is doing, but we're also encouraged about our future. How real is that future to you? As I, as I think about it, I've prayed that God make it more real to me because it's hard we we read about this but how do we really grab onto that how do we make it part of our christian mindset if you will 
and realization that this is only temporary around here, right? Our eternal destiny is in heaven. And um, he uses, again, this word citizenship. Citizens, we're all citizens of the United States. We're all citizens of a certain place. But we are also, as I've been emphasizing here, citizens of heaven. And everything we have is there. The Savior's there. Our fellow saints, all of our, I know my parents have gone. They're there. I'm excited to see them again someday. Um, our inheritance is there, it tells us. It tells us that our rewards are there, our treasures are there. It's our eternal home. So are we eagerly waiting for Christ to come and get us and take us there? How eager are you? I like the word eager there, by the way. That's the word I'm playing on, because it's the word that God kind of brought to me as I was thinking this through, and I'm thinking, how eager am I to go to heaven? And, and as I thought more about how eager I am to get there and the fact that, indeed, um, we are going there because Christ promised that we're going there, um, how eager are we to get to heaven? And I guess I thought like this. I don't know if you feel like I do, and I've kind of made it clear already, but as I watch the world around me today and see how it's devolving into chaos, adopting all these immoral lifestyles as being normal, t turning totally from God and his ways, at least in America and most of the Western hemisphere, uh, I'm sorry, the Western world, it's trying now to force all of those things on me or I'm going to be canceled. Matter of fact, I think worse things are coming for the Christian. And I'm groaning. The Bible uses those words, doesn't it? I'm kind of groaning within myself for a place where others share my values and acknowledge that God is the right and true God, that there's true justice and not all this nonsense we see politically of this person indicted and this person going to jail. And horrible, isn't it? Do you, are you eagerly waiting for Christ to return and take me to heaven and set things right? I mean, that's, that's what I got from as I thought through this, this idea of, of eagerly waiting for him. Um, is Christ really coming back, though? 2,000 years, right? Uh, you know, Jesus, you know, the, the disciples are there, they're watching Jesus ascend back to heaven. And the angels are there, and they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who's been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you've watched him go into heaven. And Jesus has promised us, he says, In my Father's house are many dwellings. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Now, either Jesus is the truth, and that's what he's going to do, and if he's not coming back, then he's a liar. Christ is not a liar. There is no doubt in the Bible, no matter what you want to think about eschatology, and I'm not going to go down that route. The guys in my Sunday school like to, I said, well, can you just pause on that? Okay? Because we all want to know the order and all the detail. So put that on pause. What you want to get, what you really want to know, there's a fact in your heart and you're like, Jesus is coming back. And he's coming for me. Am I ready? Am I serving him? Am I watching eagerly for him? They're the things I think that are important as we think about his return. And when he does come, he will set things right. He talks about those people that were false teachers or the people that were her harming the church as their end being destruction. When he comes a second time, there are two things we see in verse 21. Let me read it to you. Who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. What are the two things that happen there? The transformation of our bodies and the subjection of all things to himself. I'm going to focus on the first one mostly. The transformation of our bodies. What does that mean? It, what does it say there about our bodies? Are you using New American Standard here, right? New American Standard says the body of our humble estate. King James says our vile body. 
New uh, ESV, the English Standard Version, says the lowly body. I loved it because I was looking at all these versions. I'm saying, oh, they took this word and they made it, you know, they, they were having a hard time figuring out how to describe our current body. Now, I liked the one that said our lowly body, I think, the best. Because I think what we're going to see, we see a comparison to our current bodies and the ones that we're going to have. There's a small comparison here. There's going to be a larger comparison in 1 Corinthians, which I'll go to in a few minutes. But the transformed body is different. And as I said earlier, it's going to be made and fit for heaven. Look what it says in verse 21 there. It says about Jesus' body. It says, the body of his glory. That's what we're going to be transformed into. So Jesus, by his great power, will take these current lowly bodies, these current bodies of humiliation, and make them like his glorious body. That's what the Bible's teaching. So what is Jesus' body like? What, what kind of body did Jesus have when he lived his life on earth and went to the cross? Same kind as us, a lowly body. The only difference was his had no sin. But he still was in a body like the ones we live in today. But he died on the cross for our sins, and he paid the penalty for our sins, and God raised him up again. And he had a different body. He had a body of glory, didn't he? And as a matter of fact, I've tried to study, what do we know about this new body? How do we, now, we know Jesus' body was a little different. Jesus could do things we can't normally do. He could move through walls, he could appear, he could disappear, but then he was there. Whatever the body of Jesus is, that's what ours are going to be. Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 24, he says, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. What's first fruits? It was known in the Old Testament they would bring the first of the crops to the Lord and they'd offer them to him, and then you'd have a lot more that follow. So what's Christ? He's the first fruits, and there's a lot more to follow. That's the idea. And it says in 1 Corinthians there, For since by a man, speaking of Adam, came death, by a man, Jesus also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ first fruits. after that those who are Christ that is coming, then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to the God and the Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power, Jesus' power will transform our bodies. How fast do you think that's going to happen? You think with a lot of this transformation, it's going to take a while, right? We got to do it. You, we, I watch Transformation in America. We do, we do transformation stuff all the time. It takes a while. It's going to take a few years before we can transform. How long does this transformation with Jesus' power take? In the twinkle, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the, it's going to, there's going to be trumpet sounding, guys. When Jesus goes back, the trumpets, they're blowing. And the dead will be raised imperishable. And we will all, we will be changed. And think about that. I, I minimize this in what I'm going to tell you today, but as I was reading a Spurgeon sermon on this, he talked about the people who are alive, of course, they're going to be transformed. But all the people that are in the graves, and of course, 1 Thessalonians tells us that, they're all brought up from the dead. How does God find all those little particles and pieces that have decomposed? And he says, it was funny to actually read about it. I don't know, but he's going to find them and he's going to pull them all back together and he's going to transform them. And he's going to get, in the twinkling of an eye, he's going to transform both the dead and the living in Christ and give us new bodies. The Bible teaches that clearly. That is not a doctrine that we have to wonder about at all. God is going to give us new bodies. What will they be? We're still trying to figure that out, right? What, what is this new body, Jesus? What is it going to look like? And, 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 you know, John, the apostle John says in his, in his first epistle, he says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. I don't know all that I'm going to be yet. But... It also says we see through a mirror dimly now. 
and then we're going to see clearly, right? But here it's through, a, I talked to you about mirrors before and what they were like back then. They weren't like that. You got dim figures. But anyway, as you, as you see what you see now, you only see a little bit. I want to know more, don't you? I'm eagerly waiting for this. I want to know some more about what's going on. So, so in 1 Corinthians, interestingly enough, we do know a little more. We don't know perfectly. The Apostle John was right, but we know a little bit more. If you want to turn to it in 1 Corinthians, it's chapter 15, verses 42 through 44. Now, he's going to tell us some things, and the way he tells us is to compare the new body with the old body, okay? He says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. That's us. The resurrection of the dead, that's what we're talking about at this time when Christ returns. And he's saying, so also. He, had, he was trying to, he talked in previous verses about the sun and the stars all having the glory and how they're different. And that's his point here. The difference between the old and the new. He says, it is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So let's look at that. Let's, let's look at each of those comparisons a second. The first thing we learn that the body here below is what? Perishable. Corruptible, it says in the King James, right? It's subject to decay. Anybody, um, did I have to tell you that? <laughs> no. It becomes weak with old age, doesn't it? Even when you're young, I, I was, yeah. <laughs> it, it, and it, it lasts, it dies, and it falls into the ground, and that's it. It turns into dust. But the new body, what does it say there? It's incorruptible. It's imperishable. It's not subject to the process of disease, decay, or decline. And never, even th after thousands and millions of years, will this body fall apart. Not one iota. There's no graves in heaven. So the body of glory is going to be an immortal companion of our immortal soul. Uh, or spirit, I should say. And... It tells us in 1 Corinthians, and we just saw that, when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and, and the mortal will have put on immortality. Now what, death? No more sting. We have, and that's victory in Jesus, right? The victory of this new immortal body. Look at the next thing it says. They're sown in dishonor and they're raised in glory. There's another contrast. When we fell, when mankind fell in the garden, we lost a lot of our potential to glorify God. As we come to Christ and we live lives for him, now we do our best to yield to the Spirit and live our lives for God, but we still mess up, don't we? These new glory bodies, no messing up. Okay? We have potential to serve God. We were created for God to worship and serve God and actually be with him. It's another sermon, but throughout the whole Bible, it talks about God dwelling with his people. That's what you see from the beginning to the end. He created us to be with him, to dwell with him. But our current bodies are sown in dishonor. We have sin. Not so when we get to this later state. We will be raised in glory. Think about the current body a little bit and how it helps or hinders you in your worship of the Lord. I want to read something quickly Spurgeon said. He said, this body at present is little assistance to the spirit of prayer or praise. It rather hinders than helps us in our spiritual exercises. Often the spirit is truly willing, but the flesh is weak. We sleep when we should be praying. Ever happened to you? Yeah, the body's tired, right? We rest when we should be working for God. We dishonor God by our inability to take a full advantage of what he's given us in the creation and use it for his glory. The spots and wrinkles of sin are not yet removed. Our current body then often gravitates downward rather than upward. 
we submit to our soulish body. I don't have the pictures to show you all today, but we su we're subject to all of those things that our body craves today. And um, we're going to be raised in a body of glory. And throughout eternity, these immortal bodies are going to be honorable, pleasing, praising our Creator who has made us whole again. It says our current body is weak. I think this weak is connected to those previous two, by the way. It's sown in weakness. It's susceptible to all sorts of problems. I'm going to say it's weak in two senses, probably more, but let me just give you two. The first one is we get sick, we get hurt, and we have pain, don't we? Yeah. But we're also weak to perform our own will and, and weaker still sometimes to perform God's will. Um, you know, I don't know about you all and the weakness of our body, probably the easiest thing to talk about. I, I went out into my backyard a couple weeks ago and I'm looking at my uh, gardens back there. I said, they look a mess. This is a mess. And, and I'm looking at the borders that are around them and they're there from you know 30 years ago. I said, well, I'm going to replace those stone borders. I'm going to rake it out. I'm going to put in some mulch and add a couple plants. And this is about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. I'll be done today. Yeah. 7 o'clock at night, I'm going, oh, as I'm doing my rubber mallet to get the next stone into the ground, and it's still not done. And none of those other things had happened. I said, well, that's enough. I'll get up tomorrow, and I'll finish it. And no. No, I didn't get up tomorrow and finish it. I couldn't sleep well because I was so sore. And the next day I was so tired, I said, forget it. It took me two more tries to get done that one thing. The body's weak, isn't it? This current body is weak. But, but this new body we're going to get, when God puts our spirit into the new body, whatever we determine to do, we're going to be able to do. The current body, I, I often try to wake up in the morning and pray, and then sometimes I don't sleep like I should. The body's not doing what it's supposed to do. And then I wake up and, oh my goodness, it's too late. I wait. So I'm weak even in serving the Lord because my body's not sleeping as it should. It's weak, isn't it? The new bodies won't be like that. They're going to be raised in power. We're going to be given new bodies as a home for our soul, our spirit, if you will. And they will be able to do in power all the things we need to do. No weakness. I'm, I'm hoping it's not planting gardens. I'm not looking forward to that in heaven. Maybe it is. Maybe God, will have, you know, he did that before. I, he's put me in places of service. I thought, what do you put me here for? But, but he puts us in places of service. And anyway, our bodies will be able to do, if you will, what our minds and our spirits are telling them. And finally, we see that it's a natural. Look at verse 44 there in 1 Corinthians. It says, it is a sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. Our bodies here, these natural bodies, are fit for life here on earth, aren't they? They're natural bodies. And they have a lot of natural impulses and instincts that we have to feed them and get them rest and all the things that they need. And even with all the imperfections I was just making fun of, our bodies are pretty amazing. And God has fit them for this place and this place to live. But spiritual body, the spiritual body, by the way, I was saying this and I saw some faces frown. Don't frown now. You're not going to just float around like spirits when we're, when, when we, you know, maybe there'll be some floating. I don't know. But you're not just floating. The idea here, and, and, and Jesus kind of gave us an example because he had the resurrection body. He says the spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And remember, he ate the fish with them and everything. So Jesus had a body, the bo but his body was different. He had powers that other people, that we don't normally see. But I think most important is this new spiritual body will be well suited to the spirit, our spirit, and our spirit is the spirit that's going to serve God, right? We saw it the woman at the well, we serve God in spirit. We serve spiritually, and it's going to be the perfect housing then for our spirit, and it will obey our spirit, not our natural impulses. It's a spiritual body. And I think most importantly is we're going to be free from sin forever. Praise God for that, right? We will be morally like God and we will be free 
from sin. What a difference between the lowly body and the coming glorious body, the one that's like Christ. The final thing that this verse says is that, you know, this great power that Christ has, he will subject all things to himself. This world's not too sub subject to God, is it, at the moment? No, people are doing whatever they want. I would say something else. There's going to be no opposition to the resurrection. When Christ comes, you think any power on this earth is going to be able to stop him from doing what he's going to do? To transform us into these new bodies and to exert his power and overcome, of course, at that time, the Antichrist and all of the forces that are marshaled against him at Armageddon, Christ will prevail. We eagerly wait for his day to return, don't we? To set things right. It's going to be a day of celebration for us, but not for the world. In Revelation 1.6, it says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. And even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. When Christ comes, it's going to be a great day for us. Not such a great day for the unbeliever. Christ will subdue it. The same power that he has to transform us is going to be the same power he uses to subdue this world. And we know in Revelation, a little further on in chapter 11, it says, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Jesus will return. Have great hope, Christians. I know it looks dark out there. I know it weighs on me too. But turn back and keep your gaze fixed on Jesus, right? Because everything, that point I made earlier, is every good thing we have is from Christ. Our lives are wrapped up in Christ. Right now, right to the end, trust him. So as you're running the spiritual race then, Keep your eyes fixed on the goal. Don't look behind you. You can't undo things you've done. Focus now on Christ and what he wants you to do. Lay hold of the things he's called you to do. And I pray that as you do that, we're waiting eagerly and we're ready for his return. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and its truth. Lord, these things are great things. They're beyond even a lot of our capacity to fully understand or appreciate. And I just pray that today we would think on them. People would go back to these verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the verses here in Philippians, and reflect on them and look at them and to believe and to know, Lord, that you are there, you are with us. You are the one who is with us today, the one who is going to return, and the one with whom we'll spend eternity. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Frank, for that powerful message. Let's stand and sing our final hymn today, How Long Has It Been? Hymn number 596.
I'm going to lead you, leave you with these words. I don't know if they're a benediction, but I will say this. As we see all of these events play out that I just described at the end of that chapter, which is a great chapter in your Bibles, he says, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he tells us how to live. He says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Don't let any of these things take you off course, right? Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your work is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs>